You're listening to the MindPod Network. This episode is brought to you by City Herbals. Head on over to cityherbals.com. S-I-D-D-H-I herbals.com. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. friends welcome to the podcast it's all happening with zach leary that's me your host this is episode 83 of the it's all happening podcast i'm so happy that you're here and this week we have chris ryan phd back on the podcast he's he came on the on the show well over a year ago um sort of in early days of this podcast and it was so so great to have him back chris is uh, um, best known as the author of sex at dawn which has uh, now become kind of a seminal book about uh, how we mate, why we stray, and what it means for modern relationships. That's the subtitle of the book. And it's so, so great to have Chris back on. We got into a, a whole host of very, very interesting issues. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about attention spans. Friends, I want to talk a little bit about attention spans and uh, not just attention spans, but attention spans as it relates to media and the media that we're experiencing within the multiverse as a whole. If you're a podcast listener, uh, chances are maybe your attention span might be longer than the average human being, um, but maybe not. Maybe you find yourself drifting throughout the podcast, not knowing exactly what was just said, and then you come back to it, or maybe you rewind, or maybe you just keep it on in the background. But it is said that the average attention span today, or what's called the transient attention span, is around eight seconds. So that's about the, you know, the attention span of a goldfish, give or take, you know, a second here or there. And so combine that with the way that media and long-form complicated situations are being presented within the media. And let's just say that there's a certain orange man who tweets very complicated ideas or ideas that could be broken down to a very long-form, thoughtful, nuanced conversation and he puts it in 140 characters or less and completely distorts it. But... The attention span is so short, is so short that can, people can pick up on these ideas and run with them, and then they become these these sort of these cannonballs of distractions from what is really going on out in the world. Some may say that the certain orange man is actually very clever; that he's taking away attention from the core issues that he doesn't want people talking about because he knows how how bad they are and he wants to be able to slide them under the rug. But combined with the shifting and the mutation of human behavior, especially within millennials who are glued to their devices 24-7 and who really can't j- un, um, digest anything more than a headline, I am uh, inferring that this balance of short attention spans with the consumption of media and the digestion of ideas and the discussion of very long-form nuanced ideas is a dangerous combination. Not to say that Twitter is bad or Facebook or anything related to the actual uh, medium, to the method itself is bad, but our way that we've put everything into the Vitamix needs to be changed for sure. And we have to stop giving preferential treatment uh, to these distractions that become headline news. And it's our own fault that we've created this and it's our own fault that we're paying so much attention to it when we all know these aren't the things that matter. Friends, I wanted to share something really positive about the times that we are living in. 
When I was an ambitious, adventure-seeking teenager soaked in the sweet sounds of Terrapin Station, our entire relationship with the potentials of the medical miracles derived from the cannabis plant were nothing short but a dream consisting of fringe science and widespread illegality. Evidence and common sense were starting to show that there were many valid uses for that ancient sacred herb that went way beyond just getting high. But the possibility of there being a variety of legal, potent, and pure products available at the consumer level were years and a pipe dream away. Fast forward all this time later, and we can joyfully report that the tribe rallied and proved to the country's medical establishment that many aspects of the cannabis plant can now be used for many specific medical applications or for just what general well-being and can do so without the psychoactive effect. Take out the THC, isolate the CBDs and combine them with other potent and focused herbs and you have nature's medicine cabinet. City Herbals is at the forefront of this and their products are some of the best available. Their product lines are crafted from a combination and synthesis of the best aptogenetic herbals and premium hemp-derived extracts. Their powerful and healing tonics are revolutionary in the industry and some of the only products available in the market formulated with advanced Ayurvedic and Chinese herbal blends. If you're looking to relax, energize, or just soothe your aching bones from all that yoga that you've been doing, City Herbals has a product for you. Their offerings come in four distinct formulas that target your everyday healthy lifestyle. They are 100% non-psychoactive and are available for sale at cityherbals.com. That's S-I-D-D-H-I-H-E-R-B-A-L-S, cityherbals.com. Head on over there to take a look at the magical concoctions they are brewing up and serving near you. And also in other news, uh, before we get into the podcast with Chris Ryan, I did want to let everyone know that the Maps podcast is now live, uh, which I'm really happy about. I'm hosting it. If you go to uh, iTunes, uh, you can find it's just called the Maps podcast. So Chris Ryan is here. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Chris is back. He's been on the show before, but he's uh, you know the author of the book uh, Sex at Dawn, How We Mate, Why We Stray, and What It Means for Modern Relationships. And before that, uh, you know, Chris is just he, he's, he's spent a lot of time doing incredible things outside of America and really digging into uh, cultural anthropology into a way that, uh, you know, most Americans don't do um, because uh, we're so sort of mired in our in the American way of life. So his worldview is like no one else's. And he also uh, studied with the world-renowned psychologist Stanley Krippner at the um, Saybrook Graduate School in San Francisco, California. Chris is really brilliant. And uh, we talked about a whole bunch of crazy stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. with gorillas down my street From my window I'm staring while my coffee goes cold Look over there well. There, there's a lady that I used to know She's married now or engaged or something so I'm told The Joe Jackson song, Will You Be My Will You Be My Number Two? You know that song? Oh right. Because right. me and number one are through. It's very sad. <laughs> Joe Jackson's songs, a lot of them are pretty are pretty sad. Yeah. You know, he's got that great sort of like uh, you know, great piano player. Kind oh, of those beautiful. great kind of like yeah. those lakes, those jazz fusion, yeah. really slick licks, but they're yeah. They're sad songs. Is she really going out with Is him? Is she really going out with him? Yeah. Everyone are you really took gonna that take as, him home tonight? Yeah. Oh my god. All right. And what's the one? Is 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 it? Is this the same song where like walking with gorillas down my street? 
I don't know. Is that the same song? And then I tell myself it look real sweet. Yeah, that's it. That's the way it begins. Yeah, walking with gorillas down my street. Oh, Chris Ryan, thanks for being here, man. Are we recording? This is it, man. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) The sneak intro. We'll sneak intro. We'll play a little Joe Jackson to to start Mm. the show. A very underrated 80s artist, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, What was it? Is she really going out with him? And and, uh, there was like... Going out tonight? You remember that? Something? Is that what it's called? Um, is she really going out? Do you really want to take, take him home, home tonight? tonight? Right. Yeah, but there's another one like the, the on the town tonight or something. Stepping like, out. Stepping out. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good get. Uh, how you been? I've been good. I've been good since I saw you last. I have been around the world, like literally and geographically. I'm not talking about sex positions. <laughs> I'm talking. Where, where you been? Uh, well, you and I talked, it, we were just before we turn on the mics here, mm. we established, you reminded me that you had done my podcast yeah. uh, when I was staying in Venice, which would have been November of 2015. Wow. And, uh, so I, from there, Cassie and I went to, uh, Mexico. We went down to Tijuana to visit the, um, Ibogaine center down there. Uh, the I, Ibogaine, uh, treatment. Yeah yeah, 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 very cool. Uh, yeah, and I, I had some of those folks on the podcast, mm. and uh, we stayed at their beach house, beautiful beach house there, and uh, then we went to Mexico City for a little while, which surprised me. I hadn't been to Mexico City for, um, you know, twenty years it's or cool something. Cool city. It's great. Aside from it now, being it's super crowded and everything. It's a great city, though. And it, yeah. it was nowhere near as polluted as I remember. Yeah, I think they've cleaned it they up. Cleaned it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, really kind of livable and beautiful, at least when we were there. In affordable. November, if for, affordable. For us. <laughs> yeah, for us. Seriously. Gringos. Seriously. What? So. And then Thailand. Okay. And then Africa. Oh, where? And then Spain. Where in, oh, I was just in Spain for about three weeks. Ah. Yeah. Where in Africa were you? Uh, South Africa uh, in Cape Town. And mm. then I flew up to Namibia. Oh. And did a safari that included Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So where were you during uh, the election? Were you in America? Were you in <laughs> some far off land? <laughs> no, during the election, I was on a cruise ship that had just sailed out from Miami uh, doing this thing called the Summit Series. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah sure. Uh-huh. So they had invited me to to give a talk on that. And okay. I was kind of skeptical. I'm not real into this business model of, hey, you know, come and give away your content for free while we charge people a lot of money to be around you. Yeah, the Summit Series thing. It's uh, I was, uh, they, they approached me for a talk, but and I, it didn't work out. I don't think I made the cut. I was like, an initial round. Or well, something. you know, they don't pay you anything. They don't pay you, right? right. Yeah, but and didn't make it. But they make it. It's sort of like TED Talks at the Sea sort of thing. That's what they're trying to make it into. Yeah, right? Well, yeah. and they've got they like bought a mountain in Utah, so they <laughs> they do some in Utah, and okay. then they were doing the summit at Sea. I think okay. this is the the one I was on is the last one they're doing. Yeah, because apparently they had a, like an island in the Bahamas or something. And the idea was you, you, this giant cruise ship goes out to the Island and then everyone goes on the Island and you have this big catered lunch and it's all fancy and beautiful and amazing. But the Island got blown away in some recent hurricane or whatever. (laughs) And, I so, hate it when that happens. I, yeah. Don't you hate that? Yeah. That's the problem with, you know, that's like a real white person's <laughs> <That's>, problem. <laughs> My island was blown away. That's what Richard Branson would say to it's, a dinner. Yeah. My fucking Necker Island was blown you away. You know, you got to have your islands in short, <laughs> yeah. Richard. That's what I say. Uh, yeah, so anyway, this year, so I, I was on that ship. The ship had just left Miami. And the only reason I agreed to do it was because a bunch of my friends were on the boat, like mm. Wim Hof, um, uh, Esther Perel, mm. uh, Graham Hancock. So all these people I know and enjoy and don't get to spend as much time with as I would like, we're going to be on the ship. So I thought, oh, I'll join in and then we can all hang out and have dinner. No, y- your time's completely occupied, Oh wow! you know, being available to these people who paid money. Yeah. And they don't set it up so that you get to hang out with the other presenters or anything. It's, it's just, anyway, I don't mean to huh. bad mouth it, but Interesting. so we're on this cruise ship. Yeah. 
All these people are talking about how we're going to save the world, right? Because it's all this, like, we're all, you yeah. know, all these. Here's the new models. For yeah, the it's all these, right. you know, cutting edge ideas and all these entrepreneurs yeah. and CEOs and investment capital guys and all these geeky rich people. Sure. And so it's all this upbeat energy and everything. And we're fucking sailing to nowhere. <laughs> we're pumping carbon into the atmosphere yeah. and who knows how much shit into the ocean. Right. To just go in a circle for three days. Right, right. What the fuck, man? (laughs) So that's where I was. The first night was the election. Okay. So it was like a floating sarcophagus for the rest of the the trip. Everyone was just like shell-shocked and it was horrible oh man but but uh yeah well i mean i I guess i suppose it was horrible but no no matter where you were but i do like asking people who have been in other countries since the election i mean have you you been traveling since were you in thailand and africa since no that was all all before before. yeah yeah Yeah. i have i been out of the country so i've been to canada a couple times that doesn't count yeah they're kind of like our second yeah. Drunk cousin. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think we're the drunk cousin. Or now we're the drunk cousin. Right? <laughs> yeah. They're the, they're the good ones. Now Canada's looking a whole lot better, isn't it? Well, it's always looked good to me. I, I lived in Vancouver for two beautiful summers. Beautiful city. Beautiful city. It's beautiful. Just cold. It's just cold, but it's a beautiful city, Vancouver. Not in the summer, it's not. Yeah. I mean, in the winter, it's rainy. It's not it's not, really, not mm. much colder than Seattle, you know. It's probably a little, but it's it's on the ocean, so it doesn't like, it's not freezing like, like Winnipeg or someplace like right. that, you know. So do you yeah. think, I mean, we def- definitely don't. I mean, we're all sick of talking about it at this point, and we don't have to do like a dissection of it. You have it. a really good radio voice, oh, by thanks, the way. Man. Yeah, it's thanks. all comforting, <laughs> full of timber. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, uh, this is Speaking ep- of Canada. E- episode 83, I've, I've honed it oh, very carefully. Good, now, good. Chris, yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, and you're kind of a, you're, you're a scholar, cultural anthropologist, and you, you know about the past and, and how different civilizations have thrived and thus collapsed and then are reborn and mm-hmm. all these different things. Where do you think the current state of affairs here in America is on, on, on the spectrum of all of, of, all of this? Is this, is this just another blip? Is this a catastrophe? Is this, where is this? Does it matter at all? I think this is what it looks like. Uh, when the shit hits the fan. Yeah. The shit is this, even now hitting the fan. It's yeah. almost clogging the fan. And this is it. it we're, <laughs> we're in it. This is it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, what I have seen happening from my perspective is that there's a struggle between corporate power and governmental power. Governmental power was, you know, the only thing keeping the corporate beast in check. And... In the United States, the corporate power had the upper hand since the sure. 60s and 70s, probably, yeah. right? And then the election of Ronald Reagan was the first big sort of major blow to governmental power, and it's just continued since then. Sure. And now with the election of Trump, it's it's basically over. Yeah. You know, there's no regu- – whatever regulation Obama was able to put back into place it's, is being dismantled, you know, yeah. by the hour. Right, right, right. And, uh, yeah, so that's how I see it. I, I, you know, I've talked about this on my podcast. I see institutions as super organisms within which humans are embedded and hmm. sort of the way like we have this bacteria in our guts that we need to to digest food, but it doesn't have our DNA, right? Or or think of a beehive or an anthill or a termite mound or all these super organisms where the the community uh, acts as an organism and it doesn't really make sense. Like none of the individual termites know what the hell's going on, but they somehow their behavior coordinates in some sense that creates this uh, emergent entity. Yes. And so, you know, we can see this in nature everywhere. Everything you look at is a system. Every organism is made up of other organisms. And, you know, so why do we think it stops with us? Why would it be any different? Right. Right. Of course, we're part of a spectrum. We're part of a continuum like anything else. So. So I look above and I, and the way I started thinking about this was this book I'm finishing now called Civilized to Death which I've been plugging for about five years now. Yeah, I've been wearing this sweatshirt for like a year <laughs> and a half. I've <laughs> sold thousands. Of, I, I've taken this whole like merch thing to its next level. It's like, just sell the shirts, forget people the book. Me, people ask me all the time, what is that? It's a book Chris Ryan's working on. Maybe he's going to write. Unless he sells so many of these shirts, he doesn't have he doesn't to. Have to right? 
Well, it's like it's you like change the model. Man. I don't need a CD. You know, right. I'm just playing concerts. I'm doing podcasts. You'll completely change the model if you pull that off. Yeah. Good well, you. hey, you know what? I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Anyway, uh, working on changing the model, if not the yep. book. Uh, civilized to death. Civilized. So I was I was working on this section where I, I was sort of talking about. Um, the, you know, the subtitle that I want to use, I don't think my publisher is going to let me, but the subtitle I want to use is civilized to death. Why everything's amazing, but nobody's happy. Uh, the Louis CK yes, lines. Right. Right. Uh, and so I was sort of looking at like, okay, because there's all this research showing that extremely wealthy people aren't any happier than anyone else. Correct. And in fact, a lot of them are more miserable than the average. So, then I'm thinking, well, okay, now what the fuck does this mean? If like, what kind of casino is it where everyone leaves poorer than they walked in? <laughs> yeah, talk about a rigged game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. I mean, even the worst yeah. casino, some people walk away with more money, right. right? Yeah. So, but we're in this system where even the winners are miserable. So who's winning? What's going on here? To whose benefit does this accrue? Yes. And that's when I started thinking, well, superorganisms. It's not, no people are winning. The superorganisms are winning. winning. The institution, yeah. right. right. So there was a moment in human history around the time of the advent of agriculture where we had settled populations and yeah. extreme population growth started, which has continued unabated. Um, and you have these expansionist empires you have organized religion you have hierarchical government you have this whole different way of human interaction taking hold yeah and once that happened that's where i see these super organisms beginning to emerge it's a new life form and then their maturity was really the industrial age that's when they really started to become like, you can see it as the industrial age yeah. you can see you know different stages of maturity certainly artificial intelligence now yeah. robotics sure you know they really don't need us for much at this point right and so the way I see this is like, yes, this is the end of the American empire, but I think it's an even more important uh, juncture that we're at, which I think is that we're at the end of human domination. And now, well, I, th I think of it as a human mutation. Like yeah. I have to, because I do maintain some level of optimism in the sense that like there's, I agree with everything you're saying, but I'm looking at it as a mutation and should i mean to borrow the title of, of his book but should the better better angels of our nature you know actually come to fruition we can be able to control the mutation and use it for the better because that's what we're left with i mean everything you're saying is entirely true it's like on on, on the campaign trail that missed all that bullshit about undocumented workers taking your jobs no robots have taken your fucking jobs right. in middle america right. an undocumented worker hasn't done shit for for you the you only know? jobs yeah. they've taken the undocumented workers have taken are the ones that are paying two bucks an hour yeah, and the and jobs you that you this, won't do you wouldn't do it anyway yeah, yeah. yeah you know what documented white people are not lining up in the san joaquin valley to pick the strawberries right they're not right but you know robots are making our cars making our computers all of that kind of stuff so i mean yeah. I, I like to think that we're going to as sort of uh you know dystopian as it sounds that we're going to develop some kind of friendly relationship with them with this mutation well you know, I think there's an opportunity for that. And I'm looking uh, at the table here. You've got a Joe Rogan Experience cup in front of you. That's all I have left from being on the <laughs> show, man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Memories. Uh, I don't have a cup. And oh. I've been on the show 20 times and never gave me a fucking cup, Joe Rogan. I've been on it once. Where's my cup? <laughs> well, you got to go back. Yeah, well, you'll go back, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, the, the reason I mentioned the cup and what we're doing here is my hope lies in this information revolution that's happening where you and I can have this conversation conversation. We can talk about anything we want. Yes. We can as subversive as we want to be. Nobody's looking over our shoulder. You hit a few buttons and it goes out into the world and anyone can listen to it. Yeah, man. That's pretty amazing. That's a very cool thing. And that's, that's never existed before that's right. in the history of our species. Right. So I look at that and, and the popularity of people like Joe and, you know, who is just like us. He doesn't give a shit. He says whatever he wants, yep. you know. Um, that's amazing. And that is a reason to have some hope. Um, and so you're right. This technology is not only... 
uh, something that's corrosive to the human spirit. It can be something that's uh, that nurtures the human spirit if we use it properly. Yes. So that's part three. The reason this book, honestly, the reason this book has taken so long yep. is that I wrote it and it was so fucking depressing <laughs> because my conclusion was we are fucked. And my editor's like, uh, can't you be a little uplifting? And I'm like, no, fuck it. We're fucked. Yeah. And my job is to be honest. And sometimes when you're fucked, like, you know, the hope is hope is exactly what the casino wants. Yeah. Right. Sure. Okay. Casinos want the guy who's like, I never give up. Like, hey, I'll never give up. To- I, I'm due. I'm yeah, due. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. what the casino I'm wants. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not over till the fat lady. Well, that fat lo- lady's I, been singing. I've man. been losing all night. I'm due. Yeah, I'm due. I'm fucking due. <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. Yeah. That's what they want. So sometimes <laughs> hope is just a dumbass move, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you need to assess the situation and say, this fucking ship is going down. And I'm not going to stand here and wait because it's much better to jump off or find a boat or whatever. So anyway, that was my thing. But then, but then I, I thought about, and I was in a kind of a dark time in my life personally. And so I thought about that and it's like, okay, how much of this is just you feeling, you know, like, I don't want to project my negativity. Mm. And I realized like, well, there's some cool shit going on. And Mm. You know, I've been doing this podcast for five years or something now, and I'm hearing from all these people who are like hungry for like, how do we, I don't want to get caught in the trap. I don't want to, you know, get on the hamster wheel. What's a better way to live? I'm open to it. Like what, what can we do? How can, can you put me in touch with people? And what are the other podcasts where people are talking about that? There's this hunger to hack it, figure it out. How can we do this? The biohacking movement. Hacking everything, relationship hacking, the whole polyamory thing and, you know, people looking at, you know, gay rights and transgender. People are questioning these sort of uh, old static ways of looking at life. And that's beautiful. That that is beautiful. And, you know, I've said this a a million, million times on on my podcast, but as far as the political spectrum goes, and this also informs uh, the economic spectrum as well, like, Keep in mind that Bernie Sanders could have won. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility. He would have won he, if he, the DNC hadn't if, sabotaged it. Whatever the reasons are, I mean, he was at the grown ups table. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that is, you know, that combined yeah. with Donald Trump and, and, and this, whatever it is he represents. I mean, the, in, in my estimation, like the, the, the boomers, what, you know, the baby boomers, the greatest generation, they've hung on longer than we thought they were going to hang on because i remember my dad talking like in the early 90s that the boomers were giving way to gen x Hmm. and that was over 20 years ago and not the case the boomers have continued to flourish and continued after and old people vote old old that's it old people vote young people don't vote so i do think that if with enough collective frustration and like what you're talking about people like sort of looking for these new living systems and these new whatever hack the fuck out of whatever it is you're in yeah that there is some chance of turning this boat around i mean we're gonna break it it's gonna break yeah something's gonna break it's already broken it's already broken yeah i mean the whole global warming thing like that's you know we fucked that one up we're past the point in a return yeah we are but I mean, you know, keeping our, our rose-colored glasses on here, I think that Trump and Sanders essentially represented the same thing. They're yeah, just, just different change. Yeah, yeah, they were change agents, right? So yeah. it's and and what the DNC, their major mistake was, hey, here's more of the same, and and they didn't like people are like, no, just, no more of the same. Yeah, when they saw where Jeb Bush went, you know, he he was the guy, and he from, was gone from, from day one. She came in with so much baggage. Anyone yeah. could read that on the wall. You right know, from day one, she run was just, run. Uh, uh, what's her name from Massachusetts? The uh, uh, Warren. Yeah, Elizabeth Warren. run Elizabeth Warren. She <laughs> would have fucking something gone could you imagine elizabeth warren and donald trump in a debate yeah right (laughs) (laughs) come on yeah yeah, it it, it is pretty crazy and things are already broken but the great you know and i find this to be a uh i'm not sure if it's a tremendous comfort or a tremendous problem within the american system is that we have this veil of illusion here in america that's like you know as long as the walmart is still open everything's fine what do you mean Chris Ryan, what's all this fucking doom and gloom? Walmart's yeah. open. I can drive my SUV. What are you talking about? What's fucked? Yeah. In between your three jobs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But people like, 
you know, that's the thing here. It's like we have the yeah. shroud of like ignorance because. Well, that's yeah. it. People think, you know, people are so ignorant about the rest of the world and yes. it gets to where you yes. were starting, yes. I guess. Uh, you know, I've lived most of my life outside of the U.S. That's so right. coming back here is is so strange. You know, it's like I know this culture, but it's still foreign. A lot to of me. time in Spain, right? Twenty five years oh. based in Barcelona. In Barcelona, yeah. Oh, okay. And then I lived in Asia. I lived in Latin America. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very familiar, but it's also very strange to be here and um, to hear people that, like the crazy shit people believe, like the, you know, <laughs> Americans. Right? We're the freest country in the world. Like, no, you're not, you dumbass. You got rules everywhere. This is a giant fucking high school here. Yeah, get out. Look around. You want to see freedom? Get the fuck out of here, and then you'll see. You know, you, yeah, the minute you step into an American airport, it's like, stand behind the line, sir. Like, what? Ah, yeah. You're scaring me. Calm the fuck I'm down. not your enemy. I'm just some guy who's been flying all night. Give yeah. me a break. Yeah and, yeah, and combined with the sense of American imperialism that, like, not only are we the freest country in the world, but we're the best, and yeah. you've got to be more we're like us. We're defending freedom. We're defending freedom. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Where is that, that whole, I mean, is that like a... Uh, an extension of manifest destiny. Well, I'll tell you where the, it's very interesting that you mentioned that uh, the the idea that we're defending, we're we're fighting them over there, so we don't have to fight them over here. Yeah, right. Well, that started okay. World War One. Oh, okay, which is like what nineteen seventeen, eighteen right. something. I yeah. think America entered it in twenty, uh, and that uh, slogan was devised by a guy named Edward Bernays who was just beginning his career in the 20s. He's like the inventor of advertising. Right? He is the inventor of modern advertising, right. Yeah. right. Who right. also, I mean, he did the Virginia Slims. That's right. Co-opt feminism to get women to smoke as signs of their freedom. He he uh, he sold the fluoride from uh, Alcoa Corporation that they had stockpiled um, from their aluminum right. manufacturing. He figured out how to sell that to municipalities to dump it into the water supply. Yeah, and he was one of the first guys, too, to really understand how to use media, too, how to use print and Focus image groups. And, and focus groups yeah. and iconography yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah you know who his uncle was? Uh-uh, I don't. Sigmund Freud. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Evil fuck. Wow. Yeah. He also worked with the CIA to overthrow the uh, Arbenz government of uh, Guatemala in the 50s. I think the guy was everywhere. Yeah, man. That, evil genius. Yeah, that is evil genius. And, and it kind of makes you think, too, of like um, uh, what Hitler's guy, um, the propaganda Goebbels. guy. Goebbels. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was, I mean, as crazy and far out as they fucking get. But he was a master of media manipulation. Yeah. You know, how those guys use, I mean, they use television. The yeah. Nazis, they were the first oh, yeah. to use television, right? Yeah, those parades and, and those parades and all that probably. Lena, what was her name? The filmmaker. And, uh, she yeah. was very good. Oh, yeah. Rothenthaler or, or something. Right, Triumph of the Will. And, yeah. Right. What's, it, what's yeah. her name? Oh, they were yeah. great. I mean, the yeah. Nazi uh, sense of aesthetic yeah. and style was fantastic. Oh, my God. And and the, the, the ability to, um, uh, to, to control the message and to yeah. make it seem like this unified front that was, you know, Appealing, yeah, All right. People bought well, on it, and that's the, that was the genius of it. You make it seem like a unified front; it becomes one. Lenny Riffin style. That's who yeah, it is, that's Lenny it. Riffin style. I remember years ago, the first time I was in Bangkok. So this must have been like eighty eight, eighty seven, somewhere around there. Um, there was a guy. There was this thing in the local news because a, a, a guy. You know, there were all these travelers coming through, and the, the local people understood you could make more money selling stuff to foreigners. They'd right. pay more for a beer, or they <laughs> didn't know the local prices. So this guy had a little shop, a little cafe, and he decided he was going to revamp it to appeal to foreigners. So he uh, went and got some old Life magazines and was looking through, like, okay, what kind of, you know, what would appeal to foreigners? And he mm-hmm. found some some stuff that he liked and he repainted everything and did the whole thing up in this one style that he had seen in these magazines and had a grand opening. And it was a big problem because the style he had chosen was the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> so he had swastikas all over the place. And the, whole, the eagle, you know, the iron eagle. And he didn't know, he didn't know what World War II was all about. <laughs> he didn't know they were bad. He just saw it and was like, oh, that's a nice design right there. <laughs> oh, my God. 
<laughs> it's really funny. But it, back to the, the idea, when you said it went back to World War I about like this idea of, um, you know, American. So we, we fight over there, so we don't have to fight it here. But the idea and that kind of on top of um, this American idealism that we are the best and we have to impose our will and our way of life on the rest of the world. Yeah. Like, where did that come from? Like, I mean, that is just like that, that, I mean, it's the unspoken doctrine of our foreign policy in, in a sense. It's like, yes, we go topple other governments, but it's, we're trying to make them like us. Yeah. You know, I mean, we don't say that that's our foreign policy, but that's what it is. I mean, we're trying to make like, you know, a globalism is so McDonald's can exist in every country. And yeah, I don't know to what extent we're trying to make them like us, though, because a lot of American uh, imperialism takes the form of dictatorships. Right? Yeah, that's I mean, true. That's you know, true. the Philippines under Marcos and, you know, Latin America under all these, mili- you know, Pinochet and all that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, but what that does, though, like Pinochet in, in um, you know, in Latin America and in pretty much every case – because because you're talking about the McDonald's, so that's the the selling arm of it, right? Yeah. But there's also the resource extraction arm. Okay, and but it's also the cultural arm too. And then there's the cultural arm, yep. right? So it, which I think ties into the selling arm a lot, right? Because right. if you've got our movies, then you're going to want to buy our cars and buy our shit, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think that you know it's important to to look at a place like Chile in in the '80s with the Pinochet or. Um, you know, there are many examples in, in uh, all over the world, but certainly in Latin America, like I mentioned, Guatemala. In those cases, in the case of Chile, it was um, the Anaconda Copper Company. Like mm-hmm. the, most of the copper was coming from Chile. And okay. so when uh, Allende was elected, who promised to nationalize the copper mines and have the money, the revenue from the copper go to the people of Chile to support education and public mass transit and, you know, all these sort of socialist, uh, communist ideals, (laughs) build hospitals and, you know, things like that. Um, That's when he was assassinated and overthrown uh, by American trained generals and their, you know, and their troops. The School of the Americas in Mm -hmm. Georgia has been training corrupt military officials for a really decades. Long time. Yeah. Right. And the same thing happened with Arbenz in Guatemala. Right. You know, he was freely elected. He said, okay, we're going to nationalize the fruit farms, the banana farms, all this, take them back, keep them, keep the money for the people. We'll sell it on the free market. And, you know, but we're going to build hospitals and so on. He was overthrown immediately. So, so like the objective of sort of like the the American doctrine to to go out and to continue to do things like this. I mean, in every generation, it's a different place. Right now, it's it's the Middle East, but you're talking about you know Chile and South America. Is that based off of economic greed? You think because it has like America can have the power to sort of completely disrupt an industry. Right now, it's oil. You know, yeah, we're still, is that is that what it is? Well, I think it was, but I think now it's it's gone beyond national identity i i think Mm. national identity at this point is like what sports team you root for it's a distraction from the reality the reality is Hmm. kobe bryant doesn't give a shit about the lakers or he's a mercenary they all are right they're they're all paying they're whoever playing for whoever pays right and they're under contract and when the contract ends it renegotiated and they're not going to stay because they love the fans they don't give a shit the fans (laughs) are just you know so i think that's what national identity is at this point because exxon isn't american yeah right exxon's money is all over the world they don't give a shit the only connection that exxon has to the united states is that they have access to the united states military yes so i think what you've got there is the military is being used to defend the interests of corporations that are multinational but who's dying right Right. american people are dying and american people are paying for it right so it's a really good scam they've got set up there it's a really good marketing strategy too because it's sort of it can play on people's uh, you know tug on people's heartstrings about patriotism and right. all of these things that right. and it's sort of like the the, the great you know Republican uh, right wing sham about using social issues you know oh, you know well 
You don't want those gays. You don't want those gays and that abortion shit. Can't have that. But, you know, just tugging at the heartstrings of people while they go ahead and and, and clobber them to death. (laughs) You know that Frank Zappa quote about politics? What what does he say? Politics is the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's so sad it, it it is it is really sad but, but do you think okay yeah. no see here's what happened mm. and again i i'm gonna keep coming back to a hopeful message yeah because that's me it's springtime zach we have to it's be hopeful yeah, it is, man. uh you know 20 years ago yeah it would have been very difficult to uh to say that same-sex people have the right to marry across the country. It would have been like outlandish. Yeah, uh, marijuana yeah. is it should be legal, and nothing's going to happen. Yeah, even Obama. Remember Obama number one was yeah. anti-gay marriage. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah, right. uh, these things, when they tip, they tip fast. Yes, they do. Right, and I feel, and uh, even like um, conventional marriage, Sex of Dawn came out. I, you know. I delayed five years getting that book done too, by the way. (laughs) But when it came out, it seemed to hit at just the right moment. Mm -hmm. The wave was already kind of there. And then the book came out and a lot of people were like, yeah, this book says what I've been thinking, you know? And so, and that's why they told their friends and that's, you know? Um, And so I feel like, again, there is this great potential for radical change to happen in a very short amount of time, seemingly a short amount of time, right? Because those seeds have been germinating for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And I think people are finally looking, I hope, I mean, I've been hearing, for example, um, country Western songs Mm. that are deeply critical of American foreign policy and patriotism. Mm interesting like it? when's that ever yeah. happened it's yeah. there it is there yeah yeah and if you go back and just i mean your original point about uh the media footprint and talking about like rogan's podcast or yours or you know if you think of all of our you know whoever we are of our podcast combined you know rogan's yeah. mine yours duncan's everyone's together it's a and lot we're all fucking freaks and we're all fucking you know <laughs> taking too much acid and shouting out to the world you know or not enough and but that or yeah. not enough right and that's a that's a lot of people. That's a big media footprint, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, that's just as big as, as MSNBC's or anyone else's, you know? Well, bigger. Even bigger, right? I mean, Rachel Maddow, I, I think, you know, like, the biggest show on MSNBC gets 120, 130,000 viewers a night, something a night, like that. A night, really? Yeah. Is that it? I think so, yeah. It's a couple hundred thousand at the most. Fox was like, because I remember reading oh, this it's recently. Small. Oh. It's very small. Huh. Because it's all it's all fragmented, right? It's not right. like in the old days, Walter Cronkite. You, you only know? have three channels. You only yeah. have three choices, right? Oh, I didn't realize it was that small. Yeah, oh, shit, that's really so. Cool. Rogan's yeah. Ro- Rogan's podcast is multiples of that. Yeah, and he's doing it several times a week, yeah. and it's three hours long. Yeah, fascinating. It's Isn't not it? you know whatever. So the ideas and the people are there, right? And you know, part of what goes with that too, it's like, you know, we've always had this conversation, uh, you know, before Trump about how, well, the Democrats and Republicans are essentially the same party. It's just different heads of, heads of a different yeah. corporate monster, and, right. you know, which in large part is true. And I, I'll still kind of go with that to a point, but the difference between the consciousness of a Barack Obama and the consciousness of a Donald Trump, it's fucking massive. And that, to me, while the same, you know, maybe the neoliberalism bullshit and corporate ideologies that still are maintained, that's still a big deal to me, though, because Trump has brought, you know, the collective IQ down. And that's fucked up, man. Yeah. It's like he's not a bright guy. I mean, you know, he is, he, he's not thoughtful. He's not articulate. You know, he doesn't really have a good sense of, like, the world and of culture. That's highly disturbing to me that yeah. like at this level of dialogue is suddenly okay. It's making me That's think those up. people who who say the world's being ruled by lizards might have a point. <laughs> <laughs> They're reptilian <laughs> overlords, man. It's true. We just elected one. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. and it, and it's really in, in the whole generation gap thing. Like, do you have a perspective? Uh, like. In, you know, your, your studies of ancient cultures and like uh, even, you know, hunter gatherers or whatever period of, uh, of human existence. But was the generation gap ever as pronounced as it is now? Like, I feel like the difference between young people and old people, I mean, it's pretty major now as it was in the 60s, too. I mean, yeah. The hippies versus their parents was so big. But was it like that however many thousand years ago? Well, no, because the generation gap is 
is essentially a measure of how of the difference in the world you grew up in versus yes. the world your kids growing up in. Exactly. Right? Yes. And the thing is, in hunter-gatherer societies, that was the same world. It Nothing did. changed. Nothing changed. Yeah. Huh. For, you know, I mean, wow. okay. th- there's actually sort of a conundrum in archaeology about this because, you know, uh, they say based on the skulls, you can see that we had brains actually bigger than contemporary brains about 200,000 years ago. Wait, they had brains bigger or we do now? They did. They did. Oh. Yeah, our brains have shrunk. Since oh. since agriculture, our brains have shrunk by about 15 to 20%. Oh, shit. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, so so they've had, they had the same brains. Uh, there's there's evidence of culture and you know sophisticated interaction and trading and, and artistic um, behavior and all that. So language, certainly fire far before that. Um, so there's a lot going on. They're as intelligent as we are, or maybe smarter, um, but nothing really changed for tens of thousands of years at a time. Like they were making the arrowheads and spearheads pretty much the same. Mm. And so there's this conundrum in, in archaeology where they're saying, well, why is that? Why, why was there no invention? Why was there no, you know, sort of... Um, uh, technological advancement until mm. basically the advent of agriculture. And then suddenly there was this huge acceleration of technological development. Mm. And I reframe it. I, I look at it in a totally different way. The way they're looking at it is like, what was wrong? Why, why was nothing happening? The way I'm looking at it is, you know, that old adage necessity is the mother of invention, right? Mm. Yeah. Now the sort of background assumption in, most mainstream science concerning human evolution and, and cultural evolution hmm. is the, it goes back to Thomas Hobbes who said that before the advent of the state and agriculture and all that human life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's one of the most famous phrases in the English language, nasty, brutish, and short. Turns out that's wrong on every count. Uh, life before in hunter gatherers was not solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, or short. Right. So, I say the lack of innovation reflects the lack of necessity. Life was not a struggle to survive. If it had been a struggle to survive, you would have seen rapid technological development, because necessity is the mother of invention. There was no necessity. You look at hunter gatherers mm-hmm. now; they work twelve to fifteen hours a week. Right. They spend the rest of their time jerking off. <laughs> Just hanging out, eating They're fruit, hanging right? out in hammocks, yeah. telling stories by the fire, yeah. having sex, playing with the kids. It's a very low-stress, low-labor-intensive life. But... All um, invention doesn't come just from uh, the need to survive, does it? You know, I mean, no, no, yeah. but, but you I mean, know, just, I'm, I'm just saying yeah. that necessity okay. propels invention, right. right? If you've developed, I mean, my favorite yeah. piece of furniture is my hammock. Ah, okay. okay. And, and it's been like that for a really it's, long time. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> exactly. I, sometimes the first invention is the best. Yes. You know, the wheel. Hey, you got that right. When right. you had the first round wheel, like, what are you going to do from there? Right. You know? <laughs> Uh, the hammock is fucking amazing. Yeah. It's the perfect, you know, there's no pressure points. It moves in the breeze. You lie there and you watch the leaves going. Yeah. Your, uh, your feet are at the same height as your head, which means it's perfect for circulation. Yeah. It's you so, can have great sex in them. It's so funny. Again, it reminds me of that Louis C.K. thing, you know, when God is, 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 is talking to him and he's in, God comes back to earth and what is this thing that this car that's playing? Well, I want to go faster. You want yeah. to go faster? What the fuck do you mean you want to go faster? <laughs> Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? <laughs> Over there. Huh. Yeah, yeah. That, that's interesting. What about sex? Has sex, um, in, in all your research, did sex, um, uh, the sex for pleasure, I don't mean for procreation, sex for pleasure, has that, did, has that changed much over the years? I mean, were they still kind of doing it the same way as far as we know back then? And was it still, you know, as pleasurable? And did they take as much time with it? Was it just, <laughs> you know? All right. Well, the, the, because the hammock, if the hammock hasn't changed, yeah. you said sex in the hammock is good. But I mean, yeah. was sex the same back then? Well, okay. You know, I have to start by acknowledging that uh, there are problems with 
you know, trying to look back into prehistory. We only know, know so much, right? You know, how many <laughs> orgasms were people having? You know, it's kind of... Uh, I'm curious. Fossils though. don't tell you that, yeah. you know? I'm actually sincerely curious. So yeah. I'll tell you why after. Well, there are, there are things that we can discern and, and yeah. like educated guesses that you can make. So first of all, the, the main source of information is studies of contemporary hunter-gatherers, right, who right. live the way our ancestors did. Yeah. Unfortunately, because... Most archaeologists come from very sex negative cultures like America. Yes. They're uh, hesitant to, to observe sexual behavior, to ask questions about sexual behavior, or to publish research about sexual behavior. So, until relatively recently, there's been very little commentary on the sexual behavior of hunter gatherers, at least from American uh, anthropologists. French anthropologists, on the other hand, have mm-hmm. been more interested and have published more research on that. So that's one thing. The other uh, source of information is first contact accounts. Mm. So like all the whalers and explorers and people who washed up on South Pacific islands and, you know, even Darwin, uh, he didn't personally write about it, but the guys, some of the people on the ship had experiences and um, filtered through into his journals and stuff. Um, but so judging by that, here are a couple of things that I can, I can say about um, sexuality among hunter-gatherers. One is, uh, with very few exceptions, they have a far more relaxed attitude towards sexuality than we do. Not as puritanical. Not, not as, puritanical. Yeah. None of this, it's only for making babies nonsense. Yeah, like sure. a, a lot of people don't even know that sex makes babies. So right. the connection there is, you know, <laughs> right. superfluous. Um, women tend to have far higher status in hunter gatherer societies, uh, on a par with men. Mm -hmm. So there's none of this slut shaming bullshit. There's none of this stuff about how a woman who enjoys sex is somehow less holy or beautiful or anything. So, and because the women have direct access to what they need, meaning they know where to find the food, they know how to prepare food, they know how to build a shelter, they stick together uh, women tend to stick together in hunter gatherer societies as they do in bonobo uh, societies. Mm. They are sort of um, impervious to male attempts to control them. So if a woman wants to fuck several different guys, she's going to fuck several different guys. And there's not much <laughs> that anyone can do about it. Okay. So there's a lot more sexual freedom. Now, uh, on the other hand, there doesn't appear to be uh, a lot of uh, kinkiness. Okay. So, you know, there's very little. Now, again, this could be just because it's filtered through uptight anthropologists, sure. but I've never read about, you know, spanking or bondage or, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. And in fact, oral sex appears to be uh, unknown to a lot of hunter gatherer people. Interesting. And also, there are reports where they've asked hunter gatherer people about same sex. Uh, sex, um, you know, intercourse or whatever, and yeah. and they don't know what they're talking about. The, and, the, and these aren't sex negative cultures. They're just like, yeah, what do you mean? Like a man with a man, really? Now, I think the reason that they run into that confusion is that hunter gatherers, if someone says they're a woman, it doesn't matter if they have a dick, then they're a woman. I see. See what oh, I mean? Wow, wow. So gender yeah. classification could be made up from... It trumps uh, biological uh, in- indicators. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. So if oh. you... So in, for example, in North American uh, Native societies, many of them, especially in the Plains, there were um, lots of accounts of two-spirited people, they're called. So it's someone who's got the genitalia of one sex, but they yes. feel themselves to be the other sex. Well, we see that now these days more than ever. Right? Yeah, right. right. So this wow. this is you know a condition that's not cultural, apparently. Yes. And, and I don't mean to say a condition in a pathological sense, just a situation. Yeah. Um, and uh, but there wasn't this sort of hang up around it. So if if someone's got a penis. But they grow up saying, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I know I'm a girl. Then, okay, you're a girl. So the, wow. she does the girl things, she hangs out with the girls, she learns how to, you know, cure hides and do the things that the girls do. No hunting, no warrior stuff. And then when she reaches maturity, a man can marry her, 
And in fact, these wow. w- these women were very highly prized as wives because they're strong, oh, they wow, work sure. hard, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And the man is not considered abnormal who marries her, just a lucky guy. So our sense of what is a man and what is a woman is very sort of fixed on the biology and in non-Western societies, it tends to be much more fluid and, f- and wow. more fixed on what the person says they are. I mean, you just kind of defined the whole sort of objective of the entire trans movement of exactly what right. they're going for. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that, it's yeah. what they deserve. I mean, Absolutely, you know, yeah. Because some, yeah. I don't know if you, you watch Vice. Do you ever watch Vice? Sometimes, yeah. The second episode of this current season, the yeah. whole episode is about transgender kids. Oh. And it is amazing. Oh. The, they open with this little girl who's, she can't be more than five. And she's just like such a little girl. And so, you know, you've got these lingering doubts like, well, are they just doing this because they want attention? Or are they, yeah, yeah. then a, this is a little girl. Right. Doesn't have any a no, concept of any of no. that stuff. Right? And, and, you know, and her mother is like, you know, her, it was a very touching interview because her mother is like, you know, I, I, when I kill myself every time I think about how I used to scream at her and beat her and, wow. you know, try to get her to change and she just wouldn't change, you know? It's, it's fascinating. And as, as I uh, understand it now, like the, the explanation that I've heard kind of start, it's been bubbling up recently. That's the best explanation for it, which I just find so fascinating, is that it's the nervous system that yeah. is the opposite gender. Huh. You could be a male, but with a female nervous system. And right. the nervous system, I mean, no microscope, no blood test can detect gender of a nervous system. But right. that's what it is. Right. And that's where, you know. Yeah. That's where the spectrum gets bent. Yeah, who knows where it is. I mean there are yeah. there's theories about um the fetal environment, the mm. the mothers, the, the hormones that go into the the fetal environment when the fetus is developing uh have determinative effects and yeah. so there are all sorts of interesting, you know, theories. But the point is that the way we define things um yeah. sort of determines what they are in these in these sort of realms anyway. Um another another interesting example of this sort of thing is in Papua New Guinea there are tribes that believe that the essence of masculinity is sort of distilled in semen. So semen so if you you're a young boy who wants to grow up to be the like badass warrior, you know, the toughest, coolest man, yeah. you're going to um, suck as much dick as possible so that you ingest that semen because Whoa. that's going to make you more macho. Whoa, that's very far out. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? So there are several tribes that believe this. So, yeah. so we look at that and we say, okay, these young boys are giving blowjobs to the older boys. <laughs> okay. That's clearly gay behavior. Yeah. But to them, that's the most macho you know, sort of hetero behavior possible. Oh my God. So like wow. whatever culture defines things in ways that are, it, 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 it defines everything in a sense, right? Yeah. Certainly right. in terms of sexuality and gender and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's so people say to me like, well, what about homosexuality in, in hunter gatherer societies? And it's like, well, you, what do you call that? I mean, we would call that homosexuality. They don't. Yeah. So how do you even talk about it? This was a big thing in Sex at Dawn, too. Like, yeah, oh, sure. marriage is a human universal. Well, what do you mean by marriage? Right. You know, if you're defining it as two people hanging hammocks next to each other and fucking, then I guess so. Yes. But if you define it as, you know, obligations and property and we're going to take care of these kids forever. And, and tax breaks. I have to, like, <laughs> like your parents. And, you know, it's like all that shit. That's very different. Um, do you think, like... Uh, uh, with all the work that you've done and like, uh, you know, it, what's written about so well in Sex at Dawn and the work that Graham Hancock is doing, does that sort of the, the timeline and does it maybe disrupt, um, like, I mean, if Graham is talking about, you know, civilizations that are, I mean, we're not quite sure yet, but we have a hunch where hundreds of thousands of years ago now, what, what happened there? I mean, were these, were there like ancient perfect societies that went extinct and then all of a sudden the 
Neanderthal, then, then we started all over again? Is, is that what do you think happened? I don't know. I do, mean, do you I, like Graham's work? Do you I, I, it? I like Graham a lot personally. Um, yeah. And his, I, he and his wife have sort of become friends. And, and I, I think he's a great writer and a very smart guy. I don't see evidence for the sorts of ancient civilizations that he uh, hypothesizes. Hmm. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, so you know that I don't claim to be an expert in that. But sure. uh, I don't see evidence for that kind of thing. Um, and in the, you know, in our line as hominids, if he's talking, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years ago. You're starting to get into earlier forms pre Homo sapiens sapiens. That's right. Yeah, and uh, you know, and there's plenty of evidence for them. Uh, for Cro-Magnons and Neanderthal, which is a different line, but you know, going back hundred, couple hundred, three, four, five hundred thousand years ago, there's plenty of evidence of them. There's evidence of mm. uh, some of their settlements and so on. So it seems to me, if there were an advanced civilization, we would see direct evidence of there, that. There would be something somewhere, I right? Think so yeah, I mean, you know, and so yeah. Uh, I mean, he's he's saying like, well, a great flood completely wiped it out, and the populations yeah. were so small that they couldn't have been it. But, but, but I would think there's going to be something. Well, how how I mean, come we have the, how did the Cro Magnons leave evidence? You and know, dinosaurs in dinosaurs millions and, and millions of yeah, years ago. Yeah, we're digging up dinosaurs two hundred million years ago. Yeah, yeah, man, and this is the same thing. And I I know, man, people are going to send me angry tweets and stuff about UFOs, but I, I tend to believe that about UFOs too. And that like in this day of age, I mean, there isn't one good picture of a UFO. Yeah. There, there are a few grainy ones and sort of suspect stuff. But you know, these days we have, you know, photos of documentation of everything somewhere along the line. If there were really UFOs, there couldn't have been just one good picture. Yeah. You know? And that's what always gets me on that one. Really? Yeah, mm-hmm. the UFO thing is strange. Um, I mean, I want to believe. I do. I feel like the X Files. I want to believe. I do. Yeah. But for some reason, it just really all this. Well, time, and also wanting to know? believe is a good reason to be more skeptical, mm. right? Because you want to believe something that can be used against you. You know, as any <laughs> magician will tell you, <laughs> right? Or or preacher. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, the UFO thing's interesting. There was. You know, every once in a while there will be something in the news and then it disappears. Like I remember sort of like maybe five to ten years ago, there was an event at the Chicago O'Hare Airport where hundreds of people saw this incredible light out like right there outside the airport. And then it like flashed into the sky and disappeared. Oh, shit. And I that one. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Google it, folks. You'll see uh, it, you know, O'Hare, Chicago, I don't know, five, like I say, five or ten years ago. And I saw it in the news, and it was like, whoa, that's a big thing. And hundreds of people saw it, and all these pilots and airport workers, and everybody saw it. I guess nobody got a picture of it. <laughs> or, you know, so I don't know if it's a conspiracy. I don't know. Oh, but, man. you know, I write, you know about the Fermi paradox? No. What's that? So the Fermi paradox is... Uh, Enrico Fermi was one of the earlier nuclear researchers, right? Yeah. I think he Manhattan did, Project yeah, guy. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, he at one point he sort of calculated, okay, you know there are this this approximate number of stars in the known universe, and of that, this percentage of them are okay. roughly sure. the size that could support a yeah. planet. I know, know about this. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. So you, you get to the end of the calculation and it's like, okay, there are you know, 500 trillion planets that could support life. Yeah. So and that's a number I just pulled out of my yeah, ass, by the way. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, so where is everybody, right? <laughs> right. So, so it just makes no sense that there would be that much potential and absolutely zero evidence of life except for us. Mm. So, so the well, uh, responses to the Fermi paradox, uh, like you know, uh, um, uh, what's his name, Elon Musk, and uh, the guy who wrote this brief history of Hawking, Hawking, Stephen yeah. Hawking. So these great geniuses look at it, and, and what they come up with is that there's there's a a filter. There's this great filter where civilizations reach a certain point and then they just wipe themselves out. Right. Because their techn- technology gets ahead of them. 
as ours has, and obviously. Looking to be the case, yeah. Right. So you look at our situation and you say, well, we're just going to wipe ourselves out before we get to the point where we can go out and explore the universe or whatever. Mm. Um, but that doesn't explain the absence of radio waves, right? We've been sending radio waves out for quite a while yes, now. Yes, we have, yeah. Um, but I look at that, and this sort of ties back to what I was saying earlier about the lack of technological development through large periods of prehistory. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if, I'm sure that happens in many cases, but I wonder if there there isn't another happenstance, which is that societies develop technology to the point where they're able to look at themselves from a sort of global perspective as we are now, right? We're just on the cusp of developing this world mind we were talking about, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and we've got the technology now just recently to have all the energy we want from the sun. Yeah. You know, we can launch satellites that'll with huge uh, solar arrays that'll then micro beam it back to the planet. We don't even yep. need them in the desert, but you right. know, whatever. <laughs> so if we put a little more investment in this, we're going to have the efficiencies already doubling every year or two. Right. So we're there, right? We don't need to be burning copper or co- uh, oil. carbon and yeah. oil and all. Yeah. So we're already there. So, so societies get to this point where the technology is developed to the point where like, hey, we can, we can actually sustain this. All we need to do is reduce our population intentionally rather than just wait for some disease yeah. to kill everybody. So we've got all this incredible uh, automation, robotic technology, self-driving cars, factories that are making the cars with you know, very few people involved. So we've got far more people than we need. We've got far more money than we need. We're realizing that having more money isn't actually making people happier. What makes them happier is being part of a community, having free time, being able to chill out, being surrounded by beauty, connection to other people. So we understand this now, right? We've gotten to this point where we know what we need to do. We have the means to do it. What if we just say, okay, you're alive, $2,000 a month for the rest of your life, guaranteed minimum income. If you want to work to make more than that, you can, whatever. Mm If you don't have kids, it's $2,500 a month. So now you're incentivized not to have kids. You don't need to have kids in order to secure your future, your old age, which is the reason most people are having lots of kids in the third world, certainly. And in three or four generations, we'll have a world population down to 50 million people, which means the oceans will recover, the jungles will recover, desertification can start to reverse. We can have paradise right here. Yes. And and we don't, nobody has to die. Nobody, we're not killing anyone. Yeah. We're just saying you'll get more money not to have kids. So the idea is that maybe other people have already done this. That's what I'm thinking. And that's what, yeah. They look around and they say, you know what? Why leave? What's out there that we're not going to find right here? Or, yeah, I mean, I, I, I subscribe to that. It's a really good one. And I also subscribe, I can play around with the idea that there is an advanced technology out there that has maybe he discovered us, taken a look at us, and been like, I don't want any part of it. I'm moving on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one's kind of fucked up. I'm, right. I'm moving on. Yeah. yeah who if, wants to visit the Calcutta who, Zoo, man? Yeah. Who wants to visit yeah. this, this fucking place, man? I'm yeah. going on to the next. You yeah, know, and I, I think it could be that. Yeah, you know, I mean, if there are really that many potential life-supporting planets out there, and if we are really just one of however many millions it is, yeah, or they've got the Prime Directive, right? Yeah. Which Star Trek <laughs> right. never actually followed, right? You know, not to interfere. That's true. That's true. Too. But maybe they see us and they're like, Ooh, "Good yeah. luck, guys." <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, thanks for coming. Civilized to Death will be out one day. And one of these days, yeah. One of these days, you'll come back. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I'm trying to, I, I, my problem is that I'm a hunter-gatherer in the modern world. And hunter-gatherers are never in a hurry to get shit done. I'm not ambitious, so I'm not like, oh, I could have more money if I did this, or right. I could be on TV more. Eh. Okay. I'd rather come and chat with you than, you know, go on Fox News. <laughs> by a long shot thanks chris it's been great zach thanks